Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Helium 10 Weekly Buzz. My name is Bradley Sutton, and this is the show where we get you familiar with the latest that's going on in the Amazon e-commerce space. We interview people in the industry you need to hear from and provide training tips of the week that give serious strategies for serious sellers of any level in the e-commerce world. Let's see what's buzzing this week. Now, today we've got another jam-packed episode. We're going to talk about an update to sponsor brand videos. We've got updates that have to do with ocean shipping rates. Uh, we're going to talk uh, about a training tip on product licensing. And then I'm also going to close this, so make sure to stay to the end, with five under-the-radar strategies with Helium 10 that I would say 98% of Helium 10 members do not use. So you guys are going to have a benefit from listening to the buzz today. Let's go ahead and hop right into the news stories. Uh, first up, we've got something directly from Amazon Seller Central. Particularly, this is from Amazon Advertising. Now, this is an announcement they made last week that was entitled, Creative Editing is now available for sponsored brands video and creative. So what this is, is it says that Am uh, Amazon advertisers can now update the ad creatives of their live sponsored brand video campaigns uh, that are created with ad groups. So what happens is before you would have to kind of like do a brand new campaign if you needed to to edit the creative in your sponsored brand video campaigns. Uh, but now you are going to be able to go directly in uh, into your existing campaigns in order to go ahead and edit them. This article goes on to say that advertisers will have the option to continue delivering the campaign with the previous creative version while the edited version is reviewed by moderation. As you guys know, when you ever you do sponsored video campaigns, you actually need to wait for it to get approved before it goes live. But now no more of that. You are going to be able to go ahead and keep your campaigns going while they approve any of your edits and you're able to retain historical campaign data when you're modifying the videos within the live campaign so you know as you guys know this is uh, kind of important because also you know whenever we're talking about sponsored product campaigns or sponsored brand campaigns you've got your history of of data right and you you don't want to like imagine if you had to pause your sponsored product campaigns and, and do a and do a brand or have to do a brand new one and then you lose all of that historical data and all the training that the algorithm has been doing. So this is kind of big if you're doing sponsored video campaigns that if you know you want to change out your video or you want to change out your creative, now you don't have to worry uh, about having to start a new campaign or completely stopping your campaign while it's being approved. Let's go into the next article now. And this one was from marineinsight.com. And it's entitled, uh, Ocean Shipping Rates Plunged 60%. In 2022, so this is a uh, you know I'm sure pretty welcome news to all. It talked about how the cost incurred to ship a 40 foot container to the West Coast in the U.S. from China is about five thousand dollars per box, a drop of 60 percent from January 2022. And if you're going from Europe to from Asia, it's about nine thousand dollars, which is about 40 percent less than early 2022. Um, you know, as, as we know, at the same time, pre-pandemic levels, the rate for both routes peak at over $20,000 in September of 2021. So uh, any of you guys shipped things from China to either to U.S. or to Europe lately? Are, are you guys seeing some of these new uh, prices? I have a shipment for Project X. Uh, we ordered about 1,000 coffin shelves and some egg racks from Gee's Chicken Coop. Uh, I've got it leaving the ports hopefully in about three weeks. I'll let you guys know uh, if it's really a lot cheaper or not. But I would like to know, uh, for those of you watching this on YouTube, please let me know in the comments, are you seeing lower shipping rates as well? Uh, next article, there's actually two of them, two updates. Uh, I call it Amazon V multiple inventory. So, you know, multiple inventory, chocolates, things like that. What did Amazon say? Well, the first article here, uh, it says multiple inventory will be removed starting September 21st. So you got to have a couple weeks. Um, th this one I didn't understand. I've never done multiple inventory before, but it said that it, normally multiple inventory is not accepted from April 15 to October 15, you know, during the hot months. But starting September 21st, they're actually going to remove all multiple ASINs for a fee. Now, a secondary article that, uh, came out on this the, the very same day also on multiple inventory was called that the uh the mfn multiple shipping policy so mfn you know merchant fulfilled or fbm you know depending on how you say it 
You know, so maybe you're going to be switching to that if you were doing multiple inventory before and now you're going to do MFN. Well, there's also policies you need to be aware of. So they talked about also on September 21st, there's a new policy that says that, hey, if you start getting bad, you know, marks on your business from your MFN, multiple inventory, you're actually in danger of getting your Amazon account deactivated. All right. So it says that, hey, Amazon products have to have high quality standards when exposed to high temperatures of 75 to 155 degrees. I don't know where where the heck your product's going to get exposed to 155 degrees, but hey, it is what it is. Uh, global warming, I guess. Right. But just be pretty much understand that you cannot be uh, doing uh, multiple products shipped by yourself and getting complaints without Amazon cracking down on your account. Uh, next article, uh, Shop from CNBC says, Shopify warns merchants against using Amazon's Buy With Prime service. So, you know, we talked about Buy With Prime right here on this show uh, a few months ago. Is something where, you know, like you have your regular .com website and you put like Amazon Buy With Prime buttons on there so that people just click once or twice and it actually pulls from your Amazon inventory and they can have, you know, the they can take advantage of prime day shipping or not prime day, but prime shipping, uh, one and two day shipping uh, right there from like, you know, your dot-com websites. Now, now Shopify hasn't like completely banned this, but it's actually interesting that this uh, article brings out that Shopify is sending warning messages that Amazon's one-click checkout service violates its terms of service. And then it said that Shopify has its own payment and checkout service, ShopPay, and it seems like they definitely want to prioritize that. Um, but it's very interesting. You know, as soon as you uh, try and put these buttons on your website, they'll send you a message saying, hey, this is kind of like not in compliance with our terms of service, you know, and that, you know, we can't protect you and this and that. So, you know, something might be brewing here. So, you know, we had talked about before when we first talked about this, that, hey, maybe Shopify would be cool with this. And it would be interesting if you had a Shopify website, would you put the Amazon Buy With Prime button on there? Now, if things continue like this, you know, could they ban that button, you know, altogether? You know, if that happens, what will you do? Have any of you since April, May, when this Buy With Prime button uh, came out, uh, integrated that to one of your websites? Uh, let me know, and if you're if you're uh, I haven't heard of any issues on WooCommerce or other websites, but if you're doing Shopify and Amazon outright just or not Amazon, but Shopify bans this, uh, bans you using this button on your website, what are you going to do? Are you going to switch your platform or just you know what go back to you know using whatever you used to before? Interesting uh, developments. Now, in a lighter note, uh, the again CNBC there was another article, um, and this one is called. Uh, this couple had an Amazon theme wedding to celebrate how e-commerce brought them together. It was about Eddie Levine and Jing. Eddie has been on the uh, Serious Sellers podcast uh, uh, a while back, and they had an Amazon theme wedding. Now that they met through Amazon conferences, and I remember I remember seeing them at Amazon conferences in 2016. They weren't even dating then, and it even it talked about how their first kiss was at an Amazon seller summit in New, New Orleans. I was there. I was at, I wasn't there at their first kiss, but I was there at that uh conference. And this article is pretty pretty interesting because they maybe it's a dream of the some e-commerce you e-commerce e entrepreneurs out there. But at the wedding reception, the guests were seated at tables designated with different ASINs. All right, so ASIN numbers like determine which, uh, where you're going to go to. Party favors, the wedding favors were tiny Amazon packages that had barcodes and had treats, and they were placed in miniature shopping carts. And it's 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 just kind of um, it goes on and on. But this couple went all out with their Amazon themed wedding. So that got me thinking, it's like, hey guys, they, they can't be the only ones. There's got to be people out there who uh, maybe have met at an Amazon conference and they're both Amazon sellers and, and then they get married. Um, so I wanna know uh, who's going to, they're the first, you know, even featured on CNBC. So who's the next one, couple, e-commerce couple out there who's gonna have some Walmart or Amazon wedding pretty cool all right that's all the uh, news for today now let's go ahead and get into um the the rest of our show 
And first up, I uh, I want to give you guys my freedom ticket clip of the week. Now, this is about product licensing. You know, this is a clip from Paul Miller, and he's going to talk about what licensing is and some of the, the things that are associated with it. Guys, this is something that can give you potentially tons and tons of extra income and even the ability to compete in niches where that are overly saturated. Let's go ahead and see what Paul says about this. First of all, let's talk about what is licensing. Here's my definition. Licensing is a business arrangement in which one company gives another company permission to use its intellectual property in exchange for some valuable consideration, usually dollars in the form of royalties. What is IP or property? It can be a brand, images, music, characters, text copy, logos, products, etc. The consideration you, as I mentioned, that you exchange for the right to use that IP is usually dollars in the forms of royalties, but it can be marketing exposure, goodwill, or more. So what is a licensee and what is a licensor? A licensee is a manufacturer like you or a business with a unique or successful product who's seeking to expand and differentiate in their product line. The licensor is the owner of that property, the IP, that is looking to expand their offerings by tying their IP to the product. So let's have some examples of licensing right now. Here you see four products. First one is the George Foreman Grill. This was basically a home appliance uh, that was turned into a licensed product uh, through actually my friend Rick Cesari who developed the George Foreman grill by licensing it with George Foreman. The second item you see there is a kid's play tent, which has got a Disney princess theme on it. The third item there is an umbrella, as you can see with a sports logo. And then you got some Hello Kitty socks there. A couple of their favorite uh, licensed products of mine. Here's one example of my cozy phones. And I'm sure you'll recognize this as Elmo from Sesame Street. And another fun item, which was originally made by a company called Think Geek. This is the Star Trek pizza cutter. It's a pizza cutter in the shape of Star Trek Enterprise. So there can be all kinds of unique applications of licenses. So I think licensing uh, for us as private label sellers and brand owners solves lots of challenges. Some of the challenges that we have as owners are that we strive to be unique, we are seeking to innovate and make a better product, better than our competitors. We want to prevent copycats and hijackers. We're seeking to expand our sales channels, build brand recognition, scale your business beyond Amazon. We look for new marketing opportunities and we like to build an audience. All right, so how many of you out there have used product licensing? I'd be curious to, to know. Uh, next up, we're going to have an interview from Lem, and he's going to interview uh, somebody out there in the industry who has been using Helium 10, who has been selling on Amazon for a while. Let's see what we can learn from this interview. Hello, everybody. Here we are with our interview of the week with Andrew from Blue Tusker. He's part of Helium 10 Seller Solutions Hub. Andrew, welcome to the show. How are you doing? What's going on? Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, we're going to go ahead and dive right into it. Tell us a little bit about how <laughs> you got your start on Amazon. Yeah. So I've been in uh, digital marketing for about 15 years now, and I actually worked for my dad back in college, and he was one of the first uh, e-commerce sellers to get offered to sell on Amazon something other than books. So I always thought that was really interesting. Wow. Side note, he turned it down. So I still like to pick on him to this day. <laughs> uh, but we were, you know, we kind of got a little bit involved there. Then I stayed in marketing, yeah. but went kind of more traditional retail. But then about nine years ago, I got back into Amazon. I was in uh, in-house in an eight-figure sellers um, company. Then after that, kind of with him, started an agency that was focused on Amazon was in that um, through, uh, we exited that in late 2019. And then in early mm -hmm. 2020, obviously I'm now with Blue Tusker and we work with Amazon sellers and a lot of other marketplaces and stuff like that. But I've, I pretty much live and die by Jeff Bezos' hand <laughs> for the past eight years. <laughs> yeah, that, that's awesome. And, but you mentioned Blue Tusker. Well, to give the audience a really good synopsis, if you had to describe Blue Tusker in one or two sentences, what would it be? 
the stereotypical sales pitch is we're a full service digital marketing company for e-commerce sellers. Mm -hmm. uh, really what that basically means is you kind of consider us like a fractional marketing department. Um, you know, it, one of the things that we always find is uh, if you're any, let's say specific to Amazon, you have someone who handles mm -hmm. your SEO and your listings. You have someone who handles your design for your imagery and your storefront. And you have someone who handles you pay ads and you have to communicate between all of them. We bring it all into in-house and we have specialists for each individual aspect. So account managers, account strategists, whatever we call them, act as like mm -hmm. fractional CMOs to a certain extent. Uh, and then obviously the rest of the team acts as fractional different arms of the marketing department. Well, feel free to check them out at Blue Tusker on the Seller Solutions Hub. There's definitely plenty of Amazon software solutions out there. So what makes yeah. you yeah. at Blue Tusker stick with Helium 10? I mean, I'd be lying if I didn't tell you we haven't tried all the other ones. Uh, you know, there's there's some basic stuff of just like, you know, it, the most obvious being Helium 10, not only I think is one of the easier ones to use from a UX perspective, but also it's been around the longest. So the data that you have to leverage is a lot more accurate. So you get some of these newer platforms and they come out and they are, you know, they're saying that they have all these different options, but mm -hmm. until they connect their API, a lot of that stuff is just now coming in. So that data tends to be misconstrued. So we would actually, okay. we used to have all of them and we would actually compare and contrast the data. And after a while, I was like, this is stupid. Helium 10 has been the closest forever. Yeah. So we're just going to stick with them. I love that. And tried, tried and true method, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's that. And then Helium 10 is also one of the few that I think has, a, a you know, at least some omni-channel aspects. A lot of what we do is helping sellers do more than just Amazon. And so mm, by, you know, by having some of those tools in Helium 10, it really helps us start that transition process. Yeah, I love that. Absolutely. And of course, we got Amazon, Walmart, ideally have some other marketplaces in the next couple of years. So it's only going to get bigger mm -hmm. and better from here. Um, yeah. But that's awesome. Well, I know you said that you go towards, uh, you like Helium 10 because it definitely is leaning more towards omni-channel, but looking specific, specifically towards Amazon, what's a really quick tip, trick, or hack that people watching today can take and implement today for their Amazon business? I find that one of the most, uh, underutilized things that I guess I don't know if that's the right way to word that but like the one of the things that people never really think about is that mm -hmm. fighting the Amazon algorithm never wins but if you actually <laughs> cater to the consumer which is all Amazon wants then you mm -hmm. actually start to rank better because you're getting better sales and your conversion rate is higher well the easiest way to get your conversion rate higher is to make sure that when someone lands on your page they're extremely familiar with what they were actively searching for so one of the things we always suggest to do is besides just optimizing your listing once mm -hmm monthly quarterly however often you feel you need to do it pull a search term report from your advertising look at what the top couple terms are that you're converting for for a specific asin and then make sure that that term is either in the title or ideally in one of like the first couple pictures because if someone searches something as soon as they see it on that page they're more familiar with that is what i searched this is what that is they're more comfortable they'll actually convert a lot faster and then obviously your higher conversion rate equates to a higher organic ranking, which equates to more sales and everyone's happy. And mm -hmm. then you retire. Thank you so much, Andrew, for this interview. I'm sure a ton of people got a ton of value from this. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you, Lem, for that interview. Now, uh, lastly, like I promised, I uh, wanted to give you guys five under the radar Helium 10 hacks or Helium 10 strategies that I would say most Helium 10 users don't even know we have. All right. So this first one is uh, going to be about profits. Actually, the first few is going to be about the Helium 10 tool profits. This profits is a tool that even if you're on the starter plan at $37, uh, or $39 a month, you've got access to profits. Uh, definitely, if you obviously, if you have platinum or diamond or elite. Now, this first one is within profits. And did you know that there was a way with just a couple of clicks for you to know all of the monthly storage charges that Amazon is charging you for storing their product, your products in inventory, uh, in Amazon inventory. Now, a lot of people would have to go and try and find these reports in Amazon to do it, but this is actually right here within profits. What you guys want to do is you're going to hit the tab expenses when you're in profits. Obviously, you would need your Seller Central account uh, attached to Helium 10, and then every month you are going to see the Amazon storage fee. Like here, this was one from July for Project X and we paid $140. Now, if I'm wondering, uh, hey, which ASINs um, are, you know, caused me this $140? Well, I would click on this button where it says Amazon storage fee and right here, 
ASIN by ASIN, it's showing me what I'm paying for storage. I'm not doing very bad. For the coffin shelf, I only paid $20 for the month for storage. Uh, for for the this egg rack, I only paid $11. For the egg tray from Project X, I paid 89 cents for the whole month. So right there, guys, if you have profits right after this weekly buzz, go into profits, hit expenses. Instantly, you're going to see how much money you are paying Amazon for storage. The next thing is refunds. All right. So there is this tool inside of profits yet again that right here on the left hand side hit refunds and like right now i have this under project x for the entire year i could see a breakdown of the top five items that have been refunded uh, to customers that they are buying from uh, my account and it's sorted here look at this 30 35 33 refunds on the coffin shelf oh my goodness i can hit this button right here which is a pie chart and I can actually see the the classification. You know how when you return something on Amazon, it allows you to give a classification. So I could see that 18 of these were unwanted items. It's kind of annoying that Amazon gives uh, uh, refunds uh, or returns on this. Um, but unwanted items, there was only a couple that said it was defective. That's very good. Out of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds sold, only two said defective. Now, take a look at this. There's actually another button here where it's the comments. And so if... The Amazon buyer has put a comment. I'm going to see the return, the reason for the return. So right here on the uh, Project X egg tray, you can see that they left comments on these returns, such as doesn't fit my eggs when they're placed in the holder side by side. Another person said it makes brown marks on my eggs. So sometimes if you're getting a lot of refunds and you don't know why, it's not a requirement for buyers to leave the reason why, but they can. And if they did, Helium 10 is storing that information. You don't have to go searching for that order by order to see what they said on Amazon. Two clicks, I was able to get that information. Again, that is in profits under the refunds tab. Um, the next last part of profits I wanted to talk about, I think this is the one that probably most people actually do know about, and that's the heat maps. All right, so there's still a few of you who don't know about it, but hit the heat maps uh analytics inside of profits and then you are going to be able to see where in the country how many different warehouses your inventory is being stored at uh, and then you can see the codes here i can see hey i've got 10 coffin shelves in north randall ohio i've got three in jacksonville florida but then i'm looking at this map and i can see nowhere in like the midwest um, or you know colorado the mountain region utah idaho wyoming like i don't see any of my product there now i have about a 200 uh, coffin shelves coming to Amazon. So it would be interesting to see that, hey, once these get there, does Amazon distribute my inventory a little bit more widely? Uh, last of the five tips of the day that Helium 10 members are mainly not taking advantage of, this is in our inventory management tool. Now, first of all, a lot of people don't even realize we have full-fledged inventory management system. Uh, I talked about that a couple weeks ago, but this, this particular tip is not even on the forecasting side, all right? So if you're in inventory management, this is just, this takes two minutes to do, guys. Hit inbound shipments, all right? Inbound shipments to Amazon. And then what I would do on this page is I would go maybe even check the uh, checked in or the closed or canceled some of these uh, or all Amazon statuses. And then what I'm going to look at is the column that says units outstanding. Like, for example, this has nothing, all right? So we just sent some coffin shelves on September 6th, as you guys can see here, into Amazon. And it says 100 units shipped, 100 units outstanding. That's a no-brainer because that was just yesterday, all right? <laughs> these just got on the way. But right here for these other shipments, 20 units shipped, 0 units outstanding. 142, 0 outstanding. This is what you want to look for. Uh, you want to see if there's any units outstanding because what happens is sometimes you sh you say you ship 150 units in and then for whatever reason, the entire thing hasn't gotten there yet and you need to go check what's going on. Or maybe there's three units or four units or five units that never got checked in. Well, after that, you've got to go into Amazon and, and claim that, you know, th this was lost a lost uh, inventory uh Usually Amazon wants you to wait like two months for that to happen, but hey, no need to look into Seller Central in order to you know figure out where out of all your shipments you have outstanding units. You can do that just in two clicks in inventory management by going and clicking on the inbound shipments tab. All right, let me know how many of you didn't know about 
a few of those uh, five things that I mentioned in the comments. All right, lastly, we are coming up. It's just uh, now kind of like the official two weeks away less than two weeks away guys for sell and scale summit so there's still chance to get your tickets make sure to go to h10.me forward slash s3 as of last week we actually sold out of the vip tickets but we have regular tickets left uh it's everybody's really excited i'm super excited to meet you guys there so make sure to attend uh use the code s3bs100 if you haven't done so already to be able to get a hundred dollars off of your tickets so guys that's all for what's buzzing this week i'll see you guys next week and have a great weekend bye-bye now